Hi everyone, my name is Anne-Caroline Tanguy, call me AC, I run uh, marketing in France for the public sector and um, I have the immense privilege to be your Rome host, host today. Um, just a couple of uh, housekeeping um, points. So we have two issues on the left here and the third one on the right, which is an emergency exit. So please use the um, exits on the left. Uh, the bathrooms are outside right uh, on the left uh, when, you, when you go out. Um, also, please um, turn off your phones or put them on mute. Uh, and uh, if you haven't done it yet, please um, download uh, the app AWS Events. And uh, if you are on Android, make sure to download it via a link. Um, I will now introduce you to Joe Flasher uh, for a special session on uh, improving information and uh, communications in a disaster scenario with AWS Snowball Edge. Thank you. All right, thank you everyone for being here. Uh, I'm Joe Flasher, I'm the Open Geospatial Data Lead here at Amazon Web Services. Um, and uh, really, I'm just here uh, for the next two minutes to uh, thank Dan and the entire Element 84 team, who you'll be hearing from in a moment. Um, in addition to helping customers work, uh, figure out how to best work with their geospatial data on AWS, uh, I also sometimes uh, help support our disaster response team. Uh, and in that context, it was last year, different room, same, same event here at the Public Sector Summit. Uh, and I, uh, alongside, I was speaking alongside the humanitarian OpenStreetMap team. Uh, and I sort of put out this very nebulous idea of how you could use the cloud in disaster response situations, listening to, I believe it was a USGS earthquake feed, and how you could hook this up to a whole lot of different pieces, moving pieces in the cloud, and ultimately get to actionable information on the ground uh, using a snowball edge. Um, so I just sort of said those words. Um, I had nothing that actually worked. Um, and then when I got off the stage, Dan actually said to me right away, um, he said, like, we want to build that, right? And so, uh, first of all, I would just say, if you've never just said something on stage and had somebody build it for you, uh, you should try it. It's a fantastic feeling. Um, but second of all, again, I just want to stress how awesome it is uh, that we have partners like Element 84 to build these solutions. And so uh, I'm super excited to get Dan up here. I'm going to step off now and get Dan up here uh, to, to talk to you about what they've built. So thank you very much. All right, hello everybody. I am Dan Pallone. Um, I'm with Element84. Uh, before I get started, I do want to say, uh, to Joe's point, um, I get the privilege of getting up here and talking about this, uh, but really this is the culmination of a lot of work from a lot of different people, uh, and um, it really, they deserve kind of a shout out in terms of, of how all this thing came together. So I'm going to talk about uh, information and communications in a disaster scenario, and specifically I'm going to talk about the Snowball Edge. Um, I'm going to jump right into that because it's going to kind of be woven through the rest of the talk. So when I talk about a snowball edge, uh, they're not new. They were introduced at reInvent 2016. Um, if you haven't seen one before, they look like that. If you can see it, this is one sitting up here on stage next to me. Uh, it's 100 terabytes or up to 100 terabytes of onboard storage. It has onboard compute. But really what makes this interesting and special is that these services, they show up as AWS services. So storage looks like S3. Compute looks like EC2. And what that means is we can take things that we've built targeting the cloud, package them up, and make them available in a ruggedized box. And the, the rugged and rack mountable pieces are the key parts of this. So Amazon actually treats these as freight. Uh, if you get a chance afterwards, you can come up and kind of look at it. There's a Kindle embedded on top. That's what creates the actual address label uh, in kind of a creepy way. It can change its address in route, which is really weird. But um, this whole box kind of shows up just like this. And so kind of the original use cases for some of the snowballs was to move data from on-prem into the cloud. You could take these snowballs, pack them full of data, ship them back, and pull it. For this talk, we're going to flip that whole model over and use this to get data out. OK, so setting some context. Next thing I want to talk about real quickly is I want to show you the user interface. This is one of the, this is one of the applications we can deploy onto the snowball. What you're looking at is SWIR data. This is of the uh, California campfire. This is Maxar data. Um, and I'm going to come back to this in a couple minutes, 
But I wanted to put this up, and then I'm gonna spend the next couple minutes talking about why it looks like this. There's a lot of work that went into getting it to look to this level. So, I'm gonna set some context. Um, November 8th, 2018, uh, Butte County Sheriff Search and Response pager went off. Um, the person's pager was on a, uh, he was on a conference call. When that call ended at eight, he turned on his radio, and the first thing that came across the radio was that the fire was everywhere. The person I'm talking about is Trevor Skaggs. So, Element 84, we had been doing a uh, user needs study for disaster response. We had been talking to a bunch of different groups, Red Cross, Mercy Corps, Doctors Without Borders, doing some interviews, understanding kind of what does the disaster response space look like, what are their problems. In the course of some of this, we, met, we got a chance to meet Trevor Skaggs and do an interview with him. Um, that's him in yellow with a really enviable beard. Um, and he was a first responder on November 8th. Uh, he's with the, search, the Sheriff County Sheriff's and Rescue. He's also with the, um, the Animal uh, Disaster Group. We talked to him for a while, and he really, the, the input we got from him fundamentally changed the way we approach this whole disaster response story. So to, to give you an idea, this is a map of California, Chico in the center, paradise up there, just a little bit off to the right. Uh, a little after seven in the morning, uh, there's a tweet from the Sheriff County, um, from Sheriff doing an evacuation order uh, for the town of Polga. So the evacuation order covers the, roughly that red spot in the upper right. About 40 minutes later, there's a follow-on tweet. Uh, it expands it out to basically Paradise East, uh, heading up into Polga. 40 minutes after that, zones two, six, and seven uh, get expanded. We're now pushing into Paradise Proper. About 40 minutes after that, so now we're at around 10 o'clock in the morning, I think, um, the, the evacuation area gets expanded further. We're now looking at Centerville, Butte Creek areas under complete evacuation. By one o'clock that afternoon, there's a campfire update that comes out uh, from CAL FIRE. 8,000 acres had burned. It was 0% contained. And there were evacuation orders for Paradise, uh, Magalia, Concal, Butte Creek Canyon, and Butte Valley. So to put this in perspective, to give you an idea of what this map looks like, that's the footprint of DC. So from 7.20 in the morning until 1 p.m. that afternoon, so roughly, what's that, a six plus hours, right? An area almost twice the size of the city was on fire. Kind of by the numbers, in the first three hours, 5,000 acres burned. In the first 24 hours, 70,000. DC is about 43,000 acres by comparison. At the end of the first 24 hours, there were almost 2,300 people on scene. This is uh, police, fire, search and rescue. Um, this is the coordination effort that has to happen to pull this off. At 9 p.m. that night, uh, going back to Trevor, 9 p.m. that night, Trevor starts putting together a set, of, a kind of a GIS approach to this. His day job is actually in GIS and, and uh, DevOps, and so it was kind of this bizarre, you know, a great opportunity to take somebody who was in search and rescue and could also pull this together. But what they didn't know, the fire was moving so fast, everything was changing so quickly that they needed a way to pull this data together, and he started stringing it together by hand that evening. So, first 24 hours. Teams are trying to contain the fire. Evacuation's happening for people and animals. Traffic management is happening. At one point, the fire reaches 30 miles an hour, right? So it is actively taking out routes that are being used uh, while they're trying to route people and route evacuations. Search and rescue operations are happening, and there's a public, public communications campaign going on. Personally, he's doing search and rescue duties, incident action plan, mi building a missing person, missing person list for the SAR team. Moves over from that to the animal rescue and starts uh, filling in there. He's doing improvised routing and rescuing. He's doing training and communication. He's getting this out. And he's talking to a group of people who in the back of their head are legitimately wondering if their house, their job, if everything is burning to the ground. This is the communication. So that how do you get that kind of communication across to that group of people? And then on top of it, he's building a GIS mapping system. The big takeaway from talking to him was that what they needed was knowledge. They had, the more knowledge they could have sitting there, that was key. Um, he emphasized, he went on this little, little tear about, um, you know, don't give me a tool where I can worry about changing color palettes. Like, that was not what they were talking about. What he needed was a map on the wall with a big red spot that said, don't go there. 
and this is where the fire looks like it's heading. Like, that's the level, there's so much going on. And I'm, I'm spending some time on this because I wanna convey kind of this is the scenario that we're talking about when we talk about disaster response. We use that term a lot, a lot of people use that term, and I, I think until you kind of get a sense of the magnitude of, of what's going on, it's hard to appreciate really how simple you have to get things. So, um, a lot of this information I talked about, as well as the information we talked about in the, with the other groups, um, is available in a user needs study. Uh, this is available, you can just download it. Um, but there were some findings that overlapped with all these things. So communication, intermediate communication issues, absolutely, that, was, that resonated everywhere. Supporting analog field work, right? You can't rely on communications, you can't rely on connectivity, you can't rely on devices. Um, you need to be able to support analog field work. There are a lot of tools out there in this space, and groups are trained and trained on using those tools. Coming in and reinventing the solution is not really possible. You really need to look at that particular type of disaster, who those responders are, and what their tooling looks like. And then the last piece, and what kind of led into the Snowball Edge piece, is looking at this ability to compute uh, in the field. Can we push this out to, I'll use the term tactical edge, in situ, pick your flavor, but can we push this all the way out? So I'm gonna go back to this application. So that, that brings us back to here, right? So what, what can we put together to help this? And that was really what we started talking about. This first bullet was one of our biggest takeaways from talking with Trevor, was that there was really nothing we could do to get them a box fast enough to do something on day one. Like short of it already being in situ, short of it already being there, there was no way we could spin this up, ship this out, and get this in there fast enough to do anything. What we could do is we can get them easy access to remote sensing data. We can build a map foundation, we can give them that. We can add data sources from a bunch of different places. These were all things we could, could handle. We could do one-click publishing, we can integrate with the deployment of other tooling. But what was key was we had to get to this extremely rapid response, and this is what flipped over kind of how we did this. All right, so what we have is what we call our disaster response data pipeline. It looks like this. It starts on the left, there's an event trigger. This event trigger can be totally automated. It can be subscribing to NOAA alerts, USGS earthquake alerts, um, it, devices in situ, whatever the particular case is, or it can be triggered for, for a human, or by a human in situ, or in the event through a user interface. That trigger happens, that kicks off this whole pipeline. And I'll go into some technical details in a little bit here, but I wanna give an overview first. When, when this pipeline kicks off, the first thing we start doing is pulling together data and tools. So we can pull OpenStreetMap, Landsat, Digital Globe. We can look at things like GeoInt can take data packs. We could grab data packs off of that. Uh, we process that data appropriate for the event type. So we know what kind of event we're responding to. If it's fire, these are the layers we typically wanna see. If it's a flood, we kinda want these layers. We can pull those different pieces together. Once we have that data and the tooling uh, spun up and that's beginning to be provisioned, we can start looking at tools. So now we start looking at the, com the common tooling that they use, if they're using Map Server, if they're using QGIS on laptops. Whatever the particular tooling is, we can create, those, create deployments for those and putting all this into the cloud. We can spin this up in AWS. We build static content, so we have some basic information. We know where the event's happening. We know when the event's happening. We have information like that that we can put together for contact information. We can build this static content. And then what we can do is we can spin all of these up as ephemeral data services. So all of this just comes into existence. We can do this in minutes, um, and this whole thing exists. And we can provide a URL out. So as long as the situation, as long as the, wherever they are, actually still has connectivity, they, ha they can get to this as soon as this event triggers. And since it's, they're hitting this remote instance, we can continue to add layers, we continue to process data, we continue to move this along as the event unfolds, providing the relevant information. Okay, so now that's our rapid response. That's how we get this, how do we get this data out to them as quickly as we possibly can, that's how we do it. The next step then is how do we get this in situ? How do we take it one step further? Well now we go into provisioning and deployment. This is where the Snowball Edge comes in. So we have this idea of the Snowball Edge, it's AWS services, it's kind of a data center in a box. Well, we can take this and we can package up those services as AMIs and stage those for provisioning onto the actual box. We know the time of interest, we know the area of interest, we know the data sources, we have additional stacks we could ask for. We can package all of this stuff up and then programmatically provision a, a Snowball Edge and have it shipped either directly into the disaster zone or with a group that's heading in. Ship it to them, they can take it and carry it in with them. And we have that available. Once it's there and spun up and running, well now we have an in-situ data loop. We have the ability to, we've deployed them with all the data we could pre-stage on there. We've given them all of that information. We have tooling that they're familiar with that they can use, but what we can do is start collecting data on the ground and collecting that on the box and making that available. 
We can set up a wireless mesh network. If, you're, if you have deeper resources, you could actually set up a temporary cell tower and, and provide that kind of coverage in situ for that location and begin collecting data, uh, whether it's drone flights, mapillary, uh, capturing pictures with phones. Um, there's, a, uh, there's a tool that uh, the fire department, CAL FIRE, carries around, and they, as they drive through, they'll do an assessment of either 100% destroyed, 50% destroyed, or standing as they kind of drive down and mark these. All of that data can be aggregated back and made available and then redistributed or visualized in, the, in, in, the, in a simple way to make it available for everybody else. Okay, so it looks like this at a high level. All right, so uh, tempting fate. Uh, this is not hand waving. I'm gonna show what this actually looks like. So I'm gonna switch over and I'm gonna do a couple quick demos of, of kind of what we're talking about to give you an idea a little more concretely. So what I'm hitting here, this is actually an instance spun up on AWS. And again, I'll talk about the mechanics behind this. But what you're looking at is, is a static application. Um, it's actually written in React. This is spun up, deployed into AWS. There's a set of S3 buckets containing all of the data stacked around it. Um, th that data is being filled and maintained by processing pipelines as new data is made available. So this is looking at, Mod at uh, Aqua, or I'm sorry, MODIS coming off of Aqua. This is NASA MODIS data. You can see the smoke plume. Uh, we have Terra in here, but this is really just providing, so uh, MODIS flies on two different platforms. Um, this is showing MODIS data but, uh, from Terra, but you can use both. Um, and then we can switch over to OpenStreetMaps, and so now we can get kind of a, a little more detailed sense of what's going on. So within here, I can zoom in. This is Paradise and Chico. You can see Paradise on the upper right, Chico in the center, and I can turn on the fire boundary, right? So this is an overlay. This is that big red don't go area. This is the evacuation area that was given before. This is just a, to, on the technical side, this is just a GeoJSON layer uh, that we've put together and we've added on. Um, we can take, in addition to that, we can put a layer of VIRS fire data. So this is NASA VIRS data. So these are fire events. So this is being produced, NASA produces this in a near real time capacity. So uh, as, uh, as this data is produced, as we get updated VIRS information, this is actually a product that they, that, uh, they actually use during campfire. Um, but this is, these are fire reports and you can see the path of the fire as it's kind of creeping down towards Chico. All right, so now we have, uh, we have this application, people can hit it. In addition, we can configure additional layers, we can add additional things in there. We can flip over now and say, okay, this is what we like, this is what we want. So we have the actual start date, we know that based on the triggering event, and we can say we want a certain number of days before that. So in addition to preparing the snowball with current data, I wanna go back a little bit. And this is useful for things like change detection. This is the ability to do, to compare before and after images and, and uh, satellite overpasses, you can look at those. So we'll say we want two days before that, uh, we have our area of interest defined, which is that bounding box there. We have the layers, and we could add additional layers if that's what we want to ship with. Whoops. Uh, if that's what we want to ship with. Um, and then we have this idea of third-party stacks. I'm going to talk more about that in a minute, uh, but we have the ability to kind of configure and deploy additional stacks onto the snowball. Once these are all set, we say provision the snowball, and that kicks off this whole background process to then go ahead and make that snowball available. All right. So now... I'm going to tempt fate. I'm going to switch my Ethernet cable. You all saw me do that. I'm not making this up. Uh, I'm going to switch uh, Ethernet cables. So, and I changed tabs. So what you're looking at here is this is the instance deployed onto this snowball. So everything that I'm going to show you here is now running on the snowball completely offline. It is only connected to this Linksys router at the bottom. It is not on the internet in any way. Um, but it's gonna look very similar, which is by design. So we have Modus Aqua, I can flip over, we have uh, Terra, we can, uh, we have uh, the area, and in fact, to show you, I'm not faking this, uh, right here, you can see the boundary of where we actually uh, provisioned those tiles. So that's the edge of what we have chipped out of the overall OpenStreetMap and packaged onto the box. But we'll come back here. Again, I have, uh, you know, veers from when we initially did this. But what we can do now, <coughs> excuse me, what we can do is uh, start taking advantage of additional data uh, in situ. So uh, we worked with Maxar, and I'll talk about this in a minute, but Maxar makes available disaster response data, um, high resolution uh, imagery uh, in the event of a disaster response. So what we can do is we can take that and overlay that as well. So what you're looking at here is a high resolution image overlaid on top of OpenStreetMap. So you can see the kind of the transparency here where we're showing the routes and everything else. Um, you can see the tiles actually being fetched in. Again, these are just what we have staged, so I should be able to find an edge at some point over here. 
Um, there we go. So that's the edge of what we've actually chipped out. Um, this is smoke that you're seeing coming off of the actual campfire. But what we have here is a much higher resolution imagery. And this is imagery that we can periodically update. So right now we're in an offline scenario. This is all we have access to. Um, oh, I'm sorry, one more layer I wanna show you real fast. So the other thing we can do is uh, we can add annotations to this. So we can take this here and we can say uh, reported events. And I'm gonna talk a lot more about this in a second, but flip over to reported events. And what we can do is drop annotations on here. Um, and that's just another layer that we're bringing up and showing. Again, it's not about the user interface, it's about this information that we're pushing out. So this is a lost animal event, uh, missing animal. Uh, it's a horse, some description, where it was made, where that was last seen, contact information. That kind of data can be laid over top. Okay, but what we can do now is, uh, what, since we're in an offline scenario, we're kind of stuck with just in situ data. But what we have the ability to do is to synchronize this back. Again, we're dealing with AWS services, right? So since we're populating S3 buckets, since the whole mechanism that's created this data is still running in the cloud, pulling additional near real-time data, new data available by Maxar, whatever the case may be, we can take that and we can push that out onto the edge. And so as long as we can get connectivity back to this box, either where it is or somebody physically taking it once a day back somewhere that does have it, is we can do a synchronization and it will fetch uh, new layers, including new events and additional information. So this lets us continue to push data out to the edge as long as we have connectivity out to it. Or you can be collecting it in situ. Okay. All right, I'm going to switch back here and talk about the mechanics of this. All right. So you could switch me back to the slides. Thank you. Okay. All right, so what's going on behind the scenes? At a high level, it looks like this. Um, and I'll kind of walk through this. Uh, one of the key things to look at from a top level is that we did this all serverless, or as much of it as possible serverless. The idea is that, in theory, this should be spending most of its time idle. We don't want to be paying for high compute services that are up and running when they're not doing anything. So everything spins down, almost this entire stack spins down to zero or very near zero uh, when it's not actively doing something, when it's not actively processing data. But starting from the left, here's where we subscribe to our triggering events. Uh, subscribe to data feeds, subscribe to SNS, or, uh, SNS and notifications, uh, Twitter feed, whatever particular events we want to subscribe to to watch, or a human clicks the button. Once the human clicks the button, we spin up a whole set of intermediary services, right? So this is now where we start fetching data. This pan, again, we're in the cloud in this scenario, right? So this is the beginning. So we can scale out horizontally. Here we're pulling Landsat data. Here we're pulling Digital Globe or, or Maxar imagery. We're pulling uh, NASA MODIS or, or VIRS fire events. We can pull all these in parallel and we begin creating S3 buckets with this data. Okay. Once we have that, we can start building out the actual services. We spin up the ephemeral services. Again, we can spin those up immediately, whether it's an AMI that we start up, whether it's a packaged in a container. Ideally, that's what we would have, is that particular service is packaged in a container. We can just spin it up in an elastic cluster. We can make that URL available. This is the same piece that preps for the snowball. So in this case, we can take those services that we've been spinning up in ephemeral cases, we can package them up into AMIs and stage them for deployment onto the snowball edge. Once we have all that done, we notify everybody the URL goes out, the service is, is available. And if I go back, uh, all right, there we go. Uh, if I go back here, these pipelines, these data processing pipelines are still functioning. They're still providing data. They're still updating the data in the, the, the tiles. They're, they're uh, reprojecting, they are, whatever they need to do, they're rendering, they're reprojecting, they're tiling this, filling these data buckets, and that doesn't stop until we turn that part off. This is available. Now we get to the point where somebody says, yes, I need this to go out uh, offline. That triggers this next workflow, which then configures everything, uh, stages for the uh, Snowball Edge, kicks off a provisioning request to get a Snowball Edge out there. So what this lets us do is basically take everything that we had put together, this familiar environment, this familiar stack of tooling that we had talked about, and we can push that out onto the Snowball Edge. And the two big takeaways are it decreases the cognitive overhead. There's no room left. You're literally talking to people who are wondering if their house is burning down. There's no room to introduce anything that they don't already know if you can avoid it. So we want to reduce the cognitive overhead. We want to reduce the noise. And we want to reduce the time to learn. We want to make this available for somebody who was not trained necessarily to do this to be able to get it. Snowball Edge, let's just take this out there and stand that up. So some of the things I'm going to jump into, <laughs> I'm going to go faster apparently, and I'm also going to uh, jump into some of, the, uh, some of the pieces we talked about here. So um, you saw OpenStreetMap. We saw NASA data. We're integrating with that. 
Uh, you saw custom data, so we're creating some uh, GeoJSON layers that we're overlaying on top of this data. Um, that can come from other feeds that we just render as GeoJSON, or it's actually um, a layer we can just pick up if it already exists. And then uh, I mentioned Maxar. So Maxar, there's a couple things I wanna talk about here. Uh, one is they have an open data program for disaster response. So in the event uh, of a disaster, and they have a, they have a whole page kind of describing what those triggering events are, as well, this is released under the Creative Commons license. Um, this imagery is made available. Uh, there's high resolution imagery made available, staged online. Um, it's released as GeoTIFFs. We can then take that, process that into COGS, tile it, cloud-optimized GeoTIFFs. Uh, we can then tile it, and we can stage that for overlays. When this gets updated, we would then fetch new layers or fetch updated imagery, refresh those tiles, and make that out there. All right, now, we can push it a little bit past that, though. So uh, they also have EarthWatch, which is a, a subscription-based service, but you have access to higher resolution imagery. We can do a similar product there. It's not automated, it, require, or it's, it requires subscription, it's not open data, uh, but it is available. But the second one here, this X-Terrain, so what X-Terrain does, I've talked a lot about optical imagery, I've talked about adding layers, but there's nothing stopping us from expanding out past that. So what we can do is we could take something like X-Terrain, which is a terrain modeling, uh, it basically can do surface modeling. Um, <coughs> excuse me, we can take that, package that stack up, and deploy that on the snowball. If you're familiar with train modeling, what we can begin doing there is actually RF propagation calculations. So if you're looking at something like where do you put that temporary cell tower, we can use the train information from X-Train to actually look at RF propagation and find optimal coverage for it. And again, push that, pushing that out to the edge. All right, so now we're just getting warmed up, right? This is where we can kind of start taking this thing off the rails. We talked about day one. How do we make day one easier? Really, the key to making day one easier is get the information out there as fast as possible to as many people as possible. They, we then asked, what can we do to make week one easier? What does that look like? Well, we talked about simplified in, uh, interfaces to make it easy to pick up and use. We talked about how we would maintain data, being able to take an offline capability, sync it back, and pull current data. Well, now we want to talk about how do we integrate in situ data from various sources. So, in the architecture diagram I walked through earlier, at the top of this diagram, there's two other pieces I didn't mention. There's DynamoDB instance, and there's an Amazon Connect, or Amazon Lex is, is the service we're using there, uh, that can be spun up as well. What's happening here is we have a lot of, we can call it metadata, we have a lot of information about the actual event that's going on. We can take that and stick that into DynamoDB. We can collect all of this information and, start, and, and push all that in there. The other thing we can do, though, is actually provide a way for people to add information into that that we want to surface out to the first responders. That's where we start talking about a service called Amazon Connect. Amazon Connect is a, an ephemeral call center. Right? This, is, this is a service where you can spin up a, a call center when you need it and destroy it once you're done. Backing this, so this allows people to text information in or we can distribute additional information in, but what we can use here is we can take advantage of Lex. So Lex is the same stack that's being used for your, your Alexa to be able to do speech parsing and everything else. We can start texting information to Amazon Lex, or well, to the call center that we spin up, take that, parse that, and add that information into DynamoDB. Periodically, we can then take that DynamoDB and create a GeoJSON layer. So those events I was showing earlier about the missing animal report or whatever the case may be, we can provide a mechanism, we can provide a simple mechanism by texting or potentially calling, but where automated people can type information in there, we package it up into uh, Dynamo, periodically create a GeoJSON layer, and push that out and sync that back out to the edge. So now we have a way to collect information from offline and put it back. We can also push information back out that way if we wanted to. All right. Kicking it up another notch. Machine learning at the edge. <coughs> the, you can order a snowball edge with GPU on board. With GPU on board, it's not enough that we would be doing like training a model or trying to validate a model in situ, but what we can do is do inference at the edge. So we have, this, we have the ability to now collect information. We have new information coming in, whether it's for synchronization, we have information that we're collecting in situ. Uh, we can be doing drone collects, pulling imagery off of that. So now it becomes a question of how do we triage that data? How do we surface the right knowledge? This goes back to that knowledge question, right? How do we surface the right knowledge back to the operators in situ as quickly as possible? Well, what we can do is we can package up a model and push that model out. 
So this is not intended to replace the human that ultimately has to make the decision, but what it lets us do, we can have things like uh, damage assessment. We can have things like flood detection. We can have object detection, object recognition. And we can begin running that on the edge with imagery coming in in situ and surface the right information to the operators when they need it. Uh, this is just a simple, this is doing building detection, uh, a simple model uh, running building detection and kind of highlighting that across the area. But you could imagine uh, whatever your model would be. And if you look, uh, there's a group, Cosmic. Uh, they run periodic competitions, um, looking at training models and making those models uh, available. And those are the kind of things we would package up and make available on the edge. All right. We talk about data collection. So how do we get more data into the box in situ? <coughs> Excuse me. We have a, a product called FilmDrop. Uh, its intent was a satellite, a remote sensing satellite data management uh, pipeline. So it uh, connects up to the ground station, uh, does ingest archive, it does a higher level processing, so you've got your L0 data coming in, we can do L1, L2 processing, uh, we can do the tiling, rendering, um, and then actual data distribution. Well, what we can do is we could take this, and we have uh, basically a light version of this, because it's not going to run at scale, it's not the cloud-based one that we can run horizontally and do, um, you know, running tens of terabytes of an hour through. Um, this is something that we would be doing kind of on edge, so it's going to be a smaller scale. So it's a film drop light. We can put this on here. We can use this to process drone imagery as we're getting it back. But then that started begging the question of, well, is there any way we could actually get satellite imagery? Let's assume we don't have connectivity back. Let's assume that we're in situ. What can we do? Uh, again, in that conversation with Maxar, we ended up talking about a product they have called Tango. So Tango is a field deployable antenna. So now, I mean, this is like really kind of taking this up to 11, right? So we take this field deployable antenna, you put that out there, when you get an overpass, we could actually downlink L0 data right onto this box and process higher level. You want that chunk, you don't, you're, you're only gonna be getting the area of particular interest, but we could actually do full downlink and then stack processing, higher level product generation imagery, feed that into a, a trained model that can do detection, like say, let's say change detection, if you get a SAR overpass, synthetic aperture radar overpass, right, we could actually capture that and be able to do a change detection because we have the older data staged on here. We have that available. So now we can do current data, current acquisition, be able to do that higher level processing and render it as a layer right on top of this information. I'm gonna be able to show this. Uh, SWIR, uh, a shortwave infrared, again, for fire detection, things like that could actually be processed in situ. All right, so I'm painting a real happy picture, um, but it's not, all, uh, it's not all roses here. So there's a couple things that I do want to talk about in kind of like a, a, in a call to action kind of way. So um, thing one is we need more programmatically accessible open data. Uh, Joe Flasher, who was up here earlier, is uh, the, he mentioned the OpenGIS or Open Geospatial Data. Um, that is critical. Uh, having access to that information, it really, it, again, going back to that, how fast can we respond, that data needs to be available. We need to be able to find it. We need to be able to search for it and pull it. And we need to be able to get at it at scale and process it, and we need to be able to keep it going. So more open data is always better than not. Um, but as well, if you can, I, we, there's a whole conversation we can have around metadata and, uh, and how to make this data discoverable and everything else, but it's, it's all a piece of it. Um, Documented and simplified deployment for some of the open source tools. Uh, if you are involved in open source development, if you're part of the tooling around this, as we put this together, um, there are tools that do really incredible things supporting groups, uh, but if you weren't part of the team that developed them, they can be brutal to get deployed and packaged. Um, anything that can be done, if you're in a position to fund this, if you're in a position to, to help, or if you are supporting open source development for some of these products, uh, documentation and, and automated deployment of these things is absolutely vital. It makes this kind of stuff possible. Um, automation for the snowball edge. So once we get the snowball edge up and running, it's as simple as a URL, you can hit it and we, may, we can simplify everything else from there. But if you've never used one, when they show up, uh, they're encrypted. So first you have to decrypt them. Once you've decrypted them, you now have access to AWS services, but you're gonna to need to spin up your EC2 instances. You're gonna to need to spin up those services. You're gonna to need to wire it up to, it's gonna to connect to a network interface. The IP address is shown on the front. You then need to wire that interface up to your EC2 instance that you just spun up. There's a whole bunch of steps. We can script and automate most of it, but if something goes sideways, you're in a really difficult position. You've got people, again, who are literally trying to save lives. That's the last thing I'm gonna be doing is trying to figure out how to debug why my, my virtual NAT isn't working within the, so it's just not gonna happen. 
So uh, there's room for figuring out how do we better automate a, a snowball edge that ends up in, in situ. Um, and then lastly, uh, by way of calling for support, um, we need help testing and refining this. We, we need people that we can take this out with. This is, you know, this is not the kind of thing that it gets its first experience in an actual disaster. We're looking for exercises, we're looking for opportunities where we can take this out and get real feedback from people in the field. How, what worked, what didn't, what can we be using, what can we push out uh, sooner? So, kind of key takeaways here. Ultimately what we're talking about is how do you provide knowledge for disaster response? You have to have rapid provisioning and scaling. If you can't do it fast, one of the key problems with data and in this kind of environment is data ages, the value of data dies so fast. Once as it ages, it falls off incredibly quickly. You've gotta be able to spin this up and you've gotta be able to get it out there. And the scaling piece is not because there's gonna be millions of people hitting your application. I mean, there could be depending on whether it's public facing or not, but it's really about being able to process this data. This data is non-trivial. Um, this data is in the, uh, it's, it's, it's almost certainly in the gigabytes, it's probably in the terabytes. Um, and uh, you need to be able to do that at scale. You need to be able to do it fast. And so that's where we, that's the kind of the cloud piece of all this. The ephemeral data and services for immediate response, same deal. We gotta get these applications out and visible to people. So we push those out that way. Snowball Edge, to actually take it out to uh, in situ, push it into an offline scenario. Um, reducing that cognitive overhead, reducing that, uh, that need to learn a new tool or to understand what's being presented, you need to minimize that as much as possible. Go for simple interfaces, go for simple coloring. Um, there's a whole thing around, uh, you know, for, uh, for, from an accessibility purpose, you really need to weigh what's the simplest way to get this information out and surface it. And then lastly, and key to this, is open data and high value partners. Um, this is not something that a single group can solve. So please, if you're interested in, in being part of this in any way, I'd be happy to talk to you afterwards. Um, but that is, that is it.